Hello and welcome everyone. My name is uh, Mira Debs and I'm the Executive Director of Yale's Education Studies Program. The Education Studies Program at Yale is an interdisciplinary community that empowers students to critically reimagine and collectively reshape the educational landscape through research policy and practice. And I'm talking to you today from Hamden, Connecticut, which is on Wappinger, Pagasset, and Quinnipiac land. Our conversation this evening is about Joanne Golan's new book, Scripting the Moves, Culture and Control in a No Excuses Charter School, and the No Excuses Model more broadly. Um, professor Golan is an assistant professor of public policy and education and an assistant professor of sociology at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. This project came out of her PhD research in sociology at Princeton University, where she spent 18 months shadowing students, teachers, staff, and parents at a No Excuses Charter School. Professor Golan was interested in, initially interested in this project as a way of thinking about how schools and families transmit cultural skills, behaviors, and the habits of children. And I first heard her speak about this project at a Yale ethnography conference, thanks to uh, Professor Eli Anderson at Yale in 2014. And I was immediately captivated by this project and some of the overlaps with my own experiences teaching at a No Excuses Charter School. Um, today, uh, Professor Golan is joined in conversation with Yale alum, Michael Martinez, um, who graduated this past uh, spring He's currently working as a policy analyst at Child Trends, um, which is a research um, a think tank uh, based in DC. And his senior sociology thesis and his education studies capstone, um, both focused on the experiences and the history of the No Excuses model and the experiences of No Excuses graduates. Um, and he and Professor Golan are actually working on a collaborative project um, right now, which they'll speak some more about. Um, so our format this evening um, will be a conversation between the two of them, um, talking about um, Professor Golan's book and talking about um, some of uh, Michael's research, uh, and then we'll have time for question and answer. Um, and just uh, a little bit of housekeeping, um, make sure that your camera is muted, um, but we will certainly be adding information in the chat and please feel free to ask questions um, in the chat as we go along. We're so glad you're here um, and so excited for you to be part of this conversation. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Mira, for the invitation and the opportunity uh, to speak today with your students and your colleagues. And I'm really excited to be in conversation uh, with Michael as well. I'm also excited to be here. And I guess we can begin the conversation. Um, I was really interested in reading your book and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about it. Um, and to begin, can you describe what the No Excuses model uh, looks like for people not familiar with it? Sure. So the No Excuses model is a model that we are seeing more and more in charter schools, particularly urban charter schools. Um, and it's typically associated with schools like KIPP, Achievement First, Uncommon Schools, Success Academies. Yes, Pratt, Mastery, the list goes on. Um, I should say not all these schools will um, describe themselves as no excuses schools. And in, in more recent years, some of these schools have turned away from the label, but they share very similar practices if you walked into you know, one of these schools or another. Um, and these practices typically include things like an extended instructional day, a longer instructional day, a longer instructional year, um, intensive teacher coaching, um, an emphasis on standardized test scores and kind of data-driven instruction, and probably most notably is their disciplinary system. So a very rigid, very structured uh, disciplinary system. And these schools have kind of been attracting policy attention. They sort of came out in the 1990s, expanding in the 2000s. They continue to expand uh, because charter schools kind of on average have not been um, really any more successful than a traditional public school in raising you know, students' test scores. But these no excuses schools have had some success um, in you know, raising standardized test scores of low-income students of color. Right, and in the book, you're looking really specifically at a school called uh, Dream Academy. Can you talk about how you came to do research at Dream Academy and how your experience was studying that school? Sure. 
So Dream Academy is a pseudonym I use to protect the confidentiality of the school. Um, but as Mira was mentioning, I was um, doing my uh, PhD in sociology and looking for a dissertation topic. And I, I'm not actually sure when I first you know, heard about new exclusive schools, but one of the things I heard about was this practice they have called slant. Um, and it typically looks like this, <laughs> you know, students kind of checking the teacher. But the slant acronym stands for sit up, lean forward, ask questions, nod for understanding, and check the speaker. And uh, to me, that was like a very explicit way of teaching what I was learning in sociology, something called cultural capital. So these sort of middle class, white cultural norms for how to show attention. They were, they were literally spelling out in this word slant. And I, at that point, I was really interested in this idea of teaching cultural capital. Um, you know, could schools teach cultural capital? How was that done? Um, so that was what initially kind of got me interested um, in these schools. And I basically went around finding, you know, any school that would let me in. And Dream Academy was kind enough to let me, um, let me basically be there for, for about a year and a half. Um, and I was in the school almost every day uh, for kind of four to five hours a day. And, and I personally attended a, a no excuses middle school and high school. And I remember slant being one of the first things they taught us. So uh, reading your book, it really it made me call my decent middle school and having to do slant quite a bit. Um, like talking about cultural capital, um, what conclusions did you come to um, from your time at Dream Academy? Yeah, so um, what I ended up, I guess the main conclusion I came to is that the school did seem like it was trying to teach cultural capital and trying to do it very explicitly, you know, using these very rigid behavioral scripts. But I ended up kind of finding that the rigidity of these scripts um, undermined kind of the kind of cultural capital that we as sociologists consider to be sort of most valuable. So sociologists have talked about, um, you know, what middle class kids learn is how to sort of customize interactions to benefit themselves. They learn a sense of entitlement. Um, they learn a sense of ease with authority. And I found um, that even though the school was trying to kind of get these students ready for college and for sort of for mobility, they were really teaching a, a very different kind of, of set of skills. Um, what we would might more traditionally call working class skills, how to work hard, how to make no excuses, how to follow rules, how to be deferential to authority. And, and as you mentioned, a lot of times these were taught to scripts, which are really commonly used at Dream Academy. Can you talk more to the role of the scripts played and how they were implemented at Dream Academy? Sure. So there, um, I guess I talk in the book about student scripts, teacher scripts, school scripts, um, and scripts or kind of what you might think scripts are. So I think I define them as like detailed and rigid codes uh, for behavior. So there were lots of different kinds of scripts at the school. Um, they started pretty immediately. So uh, many charter schools admit students by lottery. Um, so following the lottery day, uh, you know, once students were admitted during that summer before they enrolled, they would get a home visit um, by some staff from the school. And the school staff would literally be given like a five page script to follow um, of what they had, what they should say to each family that they met. Um, and the script kind of went over all the different expectations in the school. You know, for example, if you're not at the school at 730, you um, are going to get an after school detention um, or that you have to slant. Um, you have to have, you know, 90 to 120 minutes of homework each night. And uh, so they had, you know, they went through this script, families had to sign, you know, this behavioral contract or the, and uh, students had to sign it as well. Um, so there were those kinds of scripts, obviously the behavioral scripts. So these schools have an approach called sweating the small stuff that I'm sure you're very familiar with uh, from your own experiences. But this is the idea that we kind of monitor and punish very small behavioral infractions. Um, so things like putting a head on a desk or, you know, talking quietly to a neighbor when it's silent time or talking in the hallway. So the school I was at had, you know, silent hallways. Um, so that's kind of another kind of script I talk about. Uh, on the teacher side, you know, teachers also did not have a lot of freedom to sort of do what they wanted. You know, traditionally we think of teachers as 
you know, having full reign over the, their classroom and their instruction and how they manage that. But in this school, teachers, um, like I said, were they were observed, you know, very frequently. They were videotaped. They were trained to follow very specific um, classroom management techniques and um, to structure their lessons in a very particular way. They had a very elaborate teacher evaluation rubric um, on which they were evaluated. So those are, you know, some examples of the scripts used at the school. Yeah, and I could definitely remember scripts uh, taking the form of um, really stringent routines. For example, the way that papers had to be passed out, papers had to be passed in. And this is something you mentioned in the book, but teachers were often have a set way of doing that and we, and having to redo it again if someone, for whatever reason, didn't do it the exact way. Um, it's just an example of some of the way that scripts can be very uh, stringent. Um, one, one of the other things that really interests me about no excuses schools is that they're often framed as race neutral, for example. Um, and I guess during your time at, at Dream Academy, did you did race ever become salient in any ways? Yeah, I should mention the school I studied was um, actually founded by a black man and, um, you know, a lot of their founding leadership uh, were people of color, which is not typical in, in no excuses schools, but um, that being said, I, I would say, you know, the school did have what you were saying, a race neutral kind of colorblind approach that, you know, these schools typically take where they don't talk about race explicitly, so they may use coded language, right, it's an urban school. Um, students are in disadvantage, but we're not sort of a directly addressing race head on. So there were very few times I found the school explicitly addressed race. And those were very early, like during, you know, new teacher orientation, teachers did take uh, an implicit bias test. Um, and, you know, there was some discussion, have you experienced racism or bias, you know, in your lives? But these, I, I didn't really see these discussions you know, being held with students, you know, during my time at the school. Uh, no excuses, schools in general have a very sort of basic skills focus, you know, reading, writing, math, uh, you know, what's kind of tested. Um, so, uh, yeah, I didn't see sort of discussion of race really in the curriculum or between teachers at staff meetings or even where you might think of it when you're talking about discipline, given the racialized nature of discipline. Um, the times where it did kind of come up were, you know, students would sometimes, you know, call a teacher racist when they felt unfairly accused, um, kind of mutter that under their breath. Um, there was one instance where there was a, uh, a teacher who was at the school from Teach for America. She was a white teacher, a young teacher, and I was in the teacher lounge one day and she was visibly upset and so I sort of listened in and what had happened is she had called a parent this is something you know they typically do you know teachers will call parents for these minor infractions um and what had happened is the son I guess had told his mother that his teacher had disrespected him so the mother was kind of you know scolding this teacher and telling her eventually telling her well you're different you know you're different um from us, you won't, you don't, we won't be able to understand us. And the school secretary, who was a, a black woman, basically said, she's basically saying, you know, in coded language, you're white, we're black. Um, and I think that, you know, that was a telling, it was very, this teacher felt very hurt by that comment, you know, as you might imagine. But I think that's a reality of these schools. Many of these schools have young, you know, white teachers and they're serving almost exclusively. Um, students of color, you know, black or Latinx students. Um, so those issues, you know, of race, racial dynamics are really important, uh, but again, tended not to be directly addressed um, at the school. Yeah, that was really interesting to, to read about. Um, I do really wonder how that might have differed had you dealt with most of these students in high school. Um, in my experience, uh, race became really salient in high school. It was very much mentioned in later grades. I think both as students became more aware, but also vocalized it along with the teachers and uh, administration. Um, so that, that might have been a, a big difference had, had you had more time in uh, a high school setting. Um, but also as, as a former student of, of an OCC school, I also noticed a lot that the disciplinary code sometimes took precedence over the academic priorities of the schools. Um, for example, this might mean um, making people pass papers back out, for example, instead of, you know, jumping right into the, the academic um, of, of the day. Did you notice a similar tension uh, at your time 
at Dream Academy? For sure. Um, discipline took up a lot of time at the school. And I mean, it's ironic in some ways, right? Or paradoxical in that many of these you know, practices are justified as a way to maximize instructional time. If, you know, a lot of, if you look at the handbook, Teach Like a Champion, we were talking about it a little bit earlier, uh, informally, Doug Lamoff's book, that's become sort of the bestseller and almost the Bible of many no excuses schools. Um, you know, one of his techniques is this idea of engineer efficiency. So uh, we want to do procedures as fast as we can, as efficiently as we can, so we can maximize instructional time. That's sort of the justification. Our students come to us, you know, grades behind. Um, we have this sense of urgency that we really need to, you know, kind of catch up. And that becomes sort of the justification for these things that you're talking about, like passing in the, you know, practice passing in the papers as quickly as you can do it. So we're wasting no instructional time. At the school I was in, it became the justification for things like why do we have silent hallways where students have to walk the hallways in single file straight lines with their classes well because this way they don't get into fights in the hallways but this way they're also not sort of wanting to continue a conversation they had in the hallway when they enter in the classroom so when they get into the classroom they are ready to work we're not wasting any time um and a lot mob even you know has somewhere where he sort of tracks I forget what it is. You know, if you save this many seconds every day, you would save this many days of instructional time over the school year. But actually what I, what I observed, and it sounds like what you experienced as well, um, was that especially with new teachers and novice, you know, it, there were classes where I felt, you know, the three quarters of the class was spent on, on this do it again, like different things, like having students march in and out of the classroom, in and out of the classroom um, until they were quiet, you know, and compliant um, or just monitoring behavior. Um, you know, one consequence of all these, this kind of micromanagement of behavior is that you get a lot of student resistance. So, um, you get a lot of these tensions, these back and forth where the teacher is standing there, you know, waiting for 100%, you know, attention and students are just resisting and pushing back. Um, and so you just, it becomes this battle where you have, you know, the teacher pitted against the student. And like you said, you're not spending that kind of time on instruction. Um, and it takes a lot of time to also establish this very particular culture and to reestablish it. So these schools actually bring students back early to socialize them into the behavioral culture, into these norms, not um, to spend that time on instruction. And I've read about other schools that they feel like after, you know, winter break, they need to spend two weeks re-socializing into these norms. So it really is um, something that takes a lot of time and certainly a lot of teachers' energies are directed um, towards instruction. I mean, if I think about the coaching conversations I sat in, I would say 90% of them were around um, behavior management and not around instruction. Yeah, and one of the, the recent developments about No Excuses that I've been following and really interested in is that a lot of these big chain uh, networks, for example, like Achievement First, KIPP, Noble, Success Academy, and, and so on and so on, have all really been talking about the changes they're making. Um, I think this really began um, last summer after during the, the cold pandemic and after the George Floyd protest that took place all summer. Um, a, lot, a lot of calls for change. A lot of these schools are really committing to changing really the disciplinary systems and making them more race con conscious. I know at Achievement First specifically, they're talking about no longer policing students for the way they, their position. So maybe backtracking from slant. Um, I know some schools have explained that they want to adopt restorative justice practices. Um, and that's all, uh, that's all really got me questioning. Can, how much these schools can change? And I guess, do you have any, any uh, thoughts about how, how these schools can reform their model um, if, if, and if it can be changed? Yeah, um, no, you're right. You know, Kip has gotten rid of his old motto, which was work hard, be nice. Um, they thought that was sort of too individualistic, not understanding sort of the structural conditions that shape opportunity. Um, both Kip and Noble, the charter network in Chicago, apologized, um, sent email apologies to their alumni um, for what, what they called racist disciplinary practices. And yeah, many networks have said, okay, we're going to adopt 
like you said, things like restorative justice um, or other kinds of more progressive disciplinary pr approaches. And actually, Mira and I um, worked on a piece together with our uh, colleague uh, Chris Torres a couple of years back that was published in the Washington Post, um, kind of thinking about this question as these things were happening. Um, while commending schools for making these efforts, uh, we also questioned, you know, how much change um, is really going to happen or is, or, or is possible given a few things. And I think one, this kind of sweating the small stuff, highly rigid culture kind of works well with, with the, the model, the goals of the model, right? Um, it's a model based on sort of direct teaching improving standardized test scores. Um, so shifting to something like restorative call, you know, restorative justice is a, is a big shift for these schools. And I think without um, making deep changes in practices, it's, it's not clear whether saying we're doing restorative justice is really, you know, gonna, gonna make these, these shifts if you still have a very um, behaviorist model or something like that. Um, and we, we refer to the work of Sarah Fine. She did her dissertation on an OCC school adopting restorative justice and, and found these kinds of obstacles. Um, she called it, I think, trying to accelerate uh, with the brakes on. We took that phrase from her. So if you, um, if you haven't yet addressed these sort of authoritarian structures, can, you know, can you just, you know, adopt restorative justice? You know, not really. Um, and there have been a lot of studies of restorative justice, not at no excuses schools, but at other kinds of schools that feel that is often kind of adopted piecemeal or that it's more symbolic or that teachers and schools will say, oh yeah, we adopted restorative justice. Actually, I did a study like this. I interviewed principals here in Nashville over their disciplinary practices because um, they were, they each had to adopt one of these four kind of progressive approaches. And they would say, um, oh yeah, we're doing restorative justice. It's the same thing we've always done. You know, we're just giving another name, which is usually not the case, right? It, it means you're sort of adopting a model and kind of making it, adapting it to sort of what you already do and not really understanding the kind of fundamentals of that model. Um, and the other thing we talked about in this, this editorial uh, was this idea that these schools really rely on novice teachers. And that's a big reason for um, their ability to scale. Um, they, they recruit a lot of teachers, you know, at Teach for America. Um, they want teachers who are coachable. But the problem with that is, you know, scripts can be actually a nice scaffold, a nice support for a novice teacher who doesn't have the experience or the knowledge to say manage a classroom. But if you're taking away that script, then it becomes much more challenging, right? If you are not from the community, if you don't have experience, um, yeah, establishing relationships with students, um, if the model you had had led to antagonistic relationships with students, I think um, it, yeah, it can be very challenging for teachers uh, to do that successfully. Um, and thus, is, I could see a school trying to do something and saying, no, this is not working, you know, um, and, and then maybe sort of pulling away from that. Um, so, so I think, you know, I certainly think change is possible and I encourage and, like I said, you know, commend these schools for moving in that direction. But I think it's certainly easier said than done. And my final question about your experience researching Dream Academy is how, do you have any advice for students trying to research schools or student experiences or maybe dealing with a school's feedback? Yeah. Um, I mean, things I tell my students are just sort of get get in the field. So, so um, you know, you may have all these ideas and theories in your head, like I kind of did going into the field, but things look very different on the ground. So if you're interested, um, yeah, go, you know, spend some time in a school, volunteer at an after school organization, start talking to some students, um, doing that kind of immersive work will generate, you know, ideas and questions. Um, another thing I often tell my students is to um, ask the school what they're interested in studying. So, um, you know, more like a, a research practice partnership. Um, because research can be extracted, research is extractive. So we take a lot, you know, from, um, you know, from these schools and, you know, time and 
and we benefit. I have this nice book, <laughs> you know, uh, but this is school, you know, necessarily benefit, not necessarily, right? So trying to think how can we, you know, balance that um, a little bit. Is there anything you can offer that school, you know, directly while you're there? Um, of, uh, maybe some highlight of some findings, you know, after you leave, um, but also looking at questions that they also might be interested because in, they may align right with your own. Um, and what they're interested in could also lend some insight to important issues in the school. Uh, but I think it's always a challenge, I think, in thinking about, um, yeah, about this work. And it's, I'm, I'm still on this learning process of how do you, because especially with the work I do, where you spend so much time, you know, in a place developing relationships with people, but then you also take sort of, need to take, I think, as a researcher, you know, sort of a critical lens or try to understand the broader kind of structures and narratives that shape what's happening on the ground. It's, you, you bring a lens that is not necessarily the lens people on the ground are using. Um, and you hope that will inform what they're doing and be helpful, but I think often it's hurtful um, and even harmful. Um, so I think it's 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 difficult to you know to do both of those things well to be both empathetic and sen sensitive um, to the people you're studying while also um, being able to be critical and to bring in your own perspective. And I think. Like I said, it's something I'm still learning, and I think, at least to to keep that on the you know the forefront when you're when you're studying, when you're writing, when you're presenting about that work, um, I think that's important. Well, let me um, <laughs> thank you for those questions and for for reading and engaging with the book. Um, as Mira mentioned at the beginning, we are uh, we are collaborating to try to um, on some of the work you started uh, as an undergraduate in the educational studies program um, and for the sociology program. And so, um, I would love for you to share a little bit about how did you end up, um, you know, how did you decide to do this project where you are interviewing. Uh, alum, alumni from an exclusive school and you're looking at their college experiences and how well prepared um, they felt for uh, for college. How did you decide to, to do that project? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, so um, throughout my time in college, I was really interested in thinking about how some of my pills I'm doing in college. Um, and I noticed going into research about no excuses, which is a lot of, not much of it covers um, the college aspect of um, the alumni of no excuses, um, which is really interesting since these schools are so focused on getting students into college. Um, so I, I really went to my senior projects really focused on trying to answer that question. Obviously, this is before your book came out, I know you have a chapter talking about how students do in college. Um, this is before then, so I was really interested in, in trying to, to fill that gap. Um, and. So I, I have similar findings to you. I, I especially students students really struggled in college with some of the, the middle class skills that you expect um, students typically have in the college setting, um, like self advocacy, um, time management, independence, and these are things that they struggled with because of uh, what a lot of them call hand holding at you know the rigid and other rigid structures at uh, no excuse to school. But interestingly, um, they were really propelled academically. Um, people talked a lot about being ready for the classes, being ready for um, the workload. And oftentimes they were not more, not often, oftentimes they were not just prepared, but they felt more prepared than the classmates they, they saw in college. Um, they thought they were more prepared than the people next to them, which I found really interesting and quite different um, th than what you would expect for students coming from a low income background. Um, so, yeah. Um. So that was one, sounds like that was one sort of surprising finding, you know, that you found from your research. Were, were there other things that um, you kind of found surprising given, obviously, you know a lot about the no excuses model and you have your personal experiences, but by kind of interviewing other alumni, were there things that, yeah, that you found kind of new and interesting? Yeah, um, of course, since there's a project on no excuses, we talked a lot about the disciplinary system at the school. Um, and one of the big surprising findings that I, was uh, the way it impacted people after they left high school. Um, 
one, one of the findings that I got was that students were very much treated differently by the system. So students who had high grades and who were typically compliant with the, the rules um, almost never got um, in trouble, almost never had the merits. I think the, they were called checks at Dream Academy. Um, they, never, they never dealt with it. But on the other hand, students who didn't get high grades, who didn't, um, who, who had a reputation as troublemakers, were somewhat targeted uh, by teachers um, using that different system. Um, and that left students developing different self-perceptions. So students who, um, who had the high grades for the developed really high self-perceptions, some of them called it untouchable. Um, and was, once they got to college, it was kind of a, a reality shock to not have that same, that same benefit of the doubt all the time. And then having to realize that they were being held to the same standard as everyone else. On the other side of it, um, students who, who were kind of targeted kind of developed a, a lower self-perception. I remember some students think that they didn't feel important or they didn't feel valued in the community. And, and I think that let some students develop imposter syndrome. Once they got to college, they, they still didn't feel like they were, compar they were comparable to the uh, classmates um, or they still felt like they weren't important. So I think it raises a lot of questions about not only the impacts of the system on the student experience, but also the long-term effects. And if it's doing a, dis the, a disservice to the school's mission of preparing students for college. Yeah, I know that's important issues of sort of identity and academic confidence. Um, we talk about the self-fulfilling prophecy in sociology. Um, you know, when you're labeled a certain way, you start, you know, acting in, in that way. So I know for undergraduates, it's not easy to, you know, to do kind of, um, to do your own research project and to go out and, and you know, collect your own data and analyze your own data. What did you find most maybe challenging um, about your work and have a, and also maybe most rewarding about that experience? Um, I think what was most challenging was, was to go into it with an, a really open mind. Um, you know, having to tell you one of these schools, I had a lot of beliefs and opinions um, going into it and a lot of expectations of what I want to define. Um, and I quickly realized that, you know, you can't do academic research having perceptions in your mind in a way, all these perceptions in your questioning. Um, so I, it took a, quite a bit of thinking to my questioning, quite a bit of conversations with both Professor Debs and my other thesis advisors on how to frame my research and how to think about it um, to make sure I was going in with a really objective and open mind. And it was really rewarding because I was able to um, get new findings, you know, not things that just affirmed what I, I had already believed, but things that kind of pushed my thinking um, in both different directions. Um, I think that was really rewarding uh, going through the, the research process. Is there any advice you would give to, uh, to educational studies uh, undergraduates um, thinking about their thesis or working on their thesis? Yeah, I, I, I know the capstone definitely seems a little bit daunting at the beginning, um, you know, a year long project, but I think, I think it's really rewarding. I think it's really important to go in with a, a project you're really passionate about. Um, because that kind of keeps you going um, once, once you know, things become a little bit difficult. Um, and I think it's also important to have a, a plan for how you, a plan for how you want to collect that. Um, for example, if you want to do interviews, I think it's really important to know that ahead of time so you can begin to schedule around that. Um, but if you also want to do like surveys or do a lip review type analysis, I think it's really important to have a, a sense of that so that you can really begin to develop the way you want to get there because th things have different timelines and depending on what kind of project you're doing, um, it's better to earlier than later on certain types of methodology. Um, if you don't mind my asking uh, about your own sort of experiences at, at a new thesis school, I wondered if you would talk a little bit about some things that you found uh, particularly you know, challenging um, at, at your own school. Do you mean uh, like, when I was in the, in the no excuses or after, oh, okay. Um, so I was definitely one of the students that didn't have a lot of vengeance for the Pennsylvania system. I kind of stayed quiet um, and did my, my own thing and whatnot. Um, but there were definitely times um, that was really difficult um, to kind of stay quiet. Um, I remember one time I got a demerit for, oh, a demerit for not having my pencil touching paper. Um, and, it, and there was a rule that if, if you responded to a, a to an infraction, you immediately got detention. So things like that were really difficult. 
to to not like respond to to like a, a disciplinary infraction that was clearly ridiculous. Um, it was also tough sometimes to learn in that environment because you can feel the tension. Um, like you mentioned before that there's a lot of student resistance. A lot of times the class would be going somewhat smoothly. Um, and then one student will be like, like have the head down or not fully be paying attention. So even though the class was going early, the teacher will stop everything and correct that student. And sometimes that will become like a a one-on-one -on -one, like argument between the teacher and the student and then the whole class is derailed. Um, I think things that made it really difficult to, to um, like focus on academics or, or just like be there peacefully because you can feel the tension. That's interesting. Um, something I actually, you know, you know, I didn't think about, you know, myself, this idea of actually feeling, a ten you know, feeling that tension. I certainly, you know, felt it, um, but that's, that's well put. Were there, were there things that your school did that you felt um, were helpful that were kind of addressing some of these you know, limitations of the neoxesis model. I know individual, you know, schools, individual networks, while sharing a similar model, do implement, you know, different practices and have tried, um, you know, different different things. They they have also learned as as they've aged. And I'm wondering, yeah, in your school, were there certain um, things you saw that, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, definitely every year of the school definitely became a little bit more lax. I remember the first year, they were really they were a lot stricter about the uniforms to, to um like even when we came in, the first thing they checked was our uniform. They checked our socks. We had to raise our pants every day and show what color our socks were in order to be compliant with the the blue or black socks uniform policy. And that's something that they uh, stopped doing, thankfully, um, the the following year. They also stopped enforcing black shoes. You originally had to have black shoes, and if you had like white spots on your shoes, they give you black tape to put on them. Um, and I remember one one day I missed an entire day of school because I, was, I forgot my belt. Um, so they definitely became more lax on things like uniform. They definitely became more lax on, on how quickly one will earn detention. Um, so they definitely tried to move away from some of, some of the, the stricter policies. And I think what, students were grateful for those, but I think students still knew that they were getting somewhat like clumps. I, I think they, the big, they had a bigger issue with the, the system as a whole rather than um, just some individual, individualistic aspects of it. Um, I guess talking more to like the academic practices, um, I know that students were really grateful for the college counseling. We all got free college counseling and that was super helpful for everyone applying to college. They paid for our SAT testing, they paid for our AP testing. Um, they paid for some students to do pre-college programs. We spent like three weeks at, at college in the summer. They did a lot of college trips and all of those things were really helpful for getting students into college. Um, I think students most just had a problem with the discipline practices and probably rightly so in a lot of cases. Yeah, they had similar rules at the school I observed. Um, all black shoes, right? You couldn't have any yeah, different colored laces and solid colored socks. Um, but once in a while they had, you know, crazy sock day where you could wear whatever <laughs> sock you wanted. Uh, but practices like those students would say, like, how does this relate to our learning? Because I, I would say like, well, the school does these things because they think X, Y, Z. But they would say, yeah, it doesn't matter what color socks I wear. Is that really going to impact, um, yeah, how I'm learning at the school? Um, as you've as you've been in the school, as you've you know studied these schools and students' experiences, are there uh, things you would recommend um, if you were you know you were asked by Achievement First to serve on their board uh, or to consult for them? Um, that's a good question. I, I did interview the the um well the the, the fat past CEO of AFA. He kind of he resigned very quickly. Um, but but last year he he told me that this past year um when they had the Zoom classes and uh they weren't using that discipline system. That's when they had the highest student approval rate. <laughs> um, so I think I think that says a lot. I think moving away from this systems at least at least in high school um was probably the, the the best recommendation I can give them. Um. Because I, I don't think it necessarily helps students get get into college or thrive in college. And I think, think that it wastes a lot of instructional time, as you've talked about. And I think that would probably be the, the biggest suggestion. Um, and maybe, yeah, I think I think that's probably the best place to go. Um, and maybe improving those science classes. A lot of people had trouble with STEM classes once they got to um, 
to to college because um in my experience a lot of times in 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 the no excuses high school they give like templates like writing templates for how to answer questions because that works really well in how to pass ap testing um but once you get to college you know you can't use a template to write things and i think that moving away from that will also be really helpful in developing some of the free thinking still seems to succeed in college Anything else you want to add about, um, yeah, your thoughts on Nevsky's schools or your experiences? No, I think we covered a lot. Um, again, thank you for taking the time to answer some of the questions I asked you earlier. Um, as I said earlier, your book really reminded me of my, my middle school experience, and I really enjoyed reading it, and I was really, really able to resonate with it. Thank you. I appreciate that.